Enterprise resource planning software, known within the trade as ERPs, refers to a type of software that organizations use to manage day-to-day -day business activities on a massive scale. Think accounting, procurement, project management, risk management, compliance, and supply chain operations. In essence, ERP software is as indispensable as the electricity that keeps the lights on. Today's ERP systems are critical for managing thousands of businesses of all sizes and in all industries. So by nature, they are highly customizable, which also means successfully migrating to a new system requires careful planning and often the right partner. In today's episode, we'll explore some of the considerations organizations need to be aware of when deploying a new ERP and why an agile approach to software deployment just may hold the key to a successful and productive user adoption path. Follow us on this journey of transformation. Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Welcome to the Performance Matters podcast from GP Strategies, your workforce transformation partner. In each episode, we'll interview industry experts and explore best practices and innovative insights to help your organization improve performance. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Michael Teal. And today on the GP Performance Matters podcast, we are talking about user adoption the agile way. And I am selfishly very, very interested in this. I work with a lot of different organizations and technology adoption is usually one of those X factors out there. So to help us really unpack this topic, we've brought in one of our many thought leaders, Scott Barber. He's the director of Agile Learning at GP Strategy. Scott, thank you so much for being with us, sir. Thank you for inviting me and having me here, Michael. Uh, always happy to talk about this. So. Perfect, got notepad and paper here. I've got a pen in my hand. So okay. we're gonna be taking some notes about this topic. So before we get into it, I've got a few questions for you. The first thing is, since since we are in a virtual world right now, where are you piping in from, Scott? Yeah, I live in uh, Marietta, Georgia. If you're a fan of the Atlanta Braves, and most of you probably aren't, uh, I live about a couple <laughs> miles north of the stadium, right next to an Air Force base uh, in Marietta, Georgia, which is in the north north uh, suburb of Atlanta. Ah, so you've you've had some good times in in uh, the, the past year with the Braves, I'm assuming. I've been to a game or two. Good for them. They were always my team. So growing up, you know, with TNT and the rise of cable, uh, my hero was like Dale Murray. Murphy to take you back there, you know, almost 40 years with the Braves. I just got a bobblehead of Dale Murphy last night, as a matter of fact. Oh, are you serious? That's sure. awesome. I'm yeah. I'm glad to see his legacy is still there. Yeah, that was my, I would imitate him as a wiffle ball player uh, as a kid in my, in my yard. So that's very cool. Okay. So let's talk professional though. We've got something in common there. I've seen on LinkedIn that you've been with GP for a long time. So just share a bit of your professional background and how you've come to this world of agile learning. Yeah, it's uh, it was kind of an interesting path. I mean, I started out really as an instructor back in the 90s of technology. Uh, that grew into becoming more interested in advanced technology. So I became a Microsoft certified systems engineer and, uh, and taught that for uh, a couple of different years, uh, traveling around a lot. And uh, from that, uh, somebody asked me if I was interested in learning SAP. I really didn't know much about SAP at that point. The company that I was working uh, for was about to go through an SAP implementation. Uh, so I was interested, knew a little bit about the technology. At the time, uh, we were just coming out of Y2K. So yeah, this was just mm. thousands. <laughs> so SAP, the popularity of it, it exploded as a result of that. And there was just a, a lot of need, particularly around end user training uh, then. So I ended up going to the SAP Partner Academy back in 2000, uh, became an SAP certified consultant. So I learned the technology piece of SAP uh, but the by far the most interesting part, and uh, because I worked at the time for a, a performance company, a training company, uh, okay. I was more interested in the adoption piece of that. So for the last 20 years, both for other companies and then uh, for first RDBD Technologies, which was acquired by GP Strategies. So I've been working for GP for over 10 years now in the industry for about 20 years uh, altogether, though. I've been mostly interested in how do people learn and effectively use SAP after an implementation. So my focus has been on organizational change management, uh, end user adoption, and uh, end user learning in the SAP space. 
Okay, so you have decades for us to unpack into mine out of out of your brain here is what I'm hearing. So I'm loving that. So, so Scott, here's one thing, non-serious topic though, is okay. what's one fact about Scott Barber that, uh, that our audience should know? I, I don't know if I should admit to this or not, but I will. So uh, sometimes <laughs> readings get long and boring, uh, particularly during COVID. I had to pick up a, uh, a skill, uh, something that I could do sitting right here uh, to keep myself entertained. Uh, so I learned how to play... <laughs> Ukulele. Oh, nice. Yeah, I so, love it. Yeah. Okay. I'm assuming you can play somewhere over the rainbow. Yeah. That's kind of the, that's kind of the gateway drug for the ukulele, I think. Okay. I love it. So we might have to have you play us off a little bit here later on. So just mentally be prepared for that. That might be a nice little bonus here. Yeah. Go ahead and turn down the volume now. Sure. Okay. So I am going to try to keep you agile. But in right there. So, OK, so, Scott, we, we know that um, the fact is, if we're kind of getting into this, the fact that the majority of organizations struggle with adoption, specifically when it's enterprise technology at that massive scale. So knowing that you've been in that field, you've seen the battles. Why is that? What's your perspective? Uh, well, I think I think it's an, a, a, an overwhelming amount of attention is paid in one certain area of an adoption. And we. The way we explain this is in the TAC model, right? Triangle, uh, very, very easy. In the TAC model, uh, the quality of an adoption, right? And the adoption phase of an ERP implementation is where people start using it, right? They're using it to run the business. So the effectiveness of that adoption is a function really of three different things. The technology itself, right? Technology has to be high quality, has to work, has to be reliable, has to be tested, has to have good data, good legacy data. So there are all of these things that have to happen with the technology for that to work. Uh, and unfortunately, that's where most of the attention is typically devoted to in an ERP implementation. Uh, but there are other factors also, people factors. And uh, one of those is ability. Uh, do I have the knowledge and skills or do the end users have the knowledge and skills that they need in order to be successful after the go live? Can they actually use the new system? Uh, and commitment, right? Are people committed to it? Uh, do they, uh, are they enthusiastic about the change? And so when you look at technology, ability, and commitment, we call them the TAC model very simply. And they're typically three parts of a project that are responsible for each of those areas. Technology is IT, the implementation partner. Uh, commitment is typically a function of organizational change management. And then the area that interests me the most is ability. Do people have the knowledge and skills that they need in order to behave differently with the new system after the go live and be effective at it. So what we found in our, our, uh, our assertion is that unless you have a high level of quality in all three of these areas, your adoption is probably gonna struggle. Very interesting. So that's, it's a trinity, it's a triumvirate, it's a three-legged stool, you have to have those. But what you're saying is most organizations have just too much focus on the technology side and they haven't quite nurtured the ability and the commitment, correct? Well, just, just to give you an example, I mean, there are different kinds of commitment that an organization uh, has. Uh, and, in, and I should have mentioned, I'm also a, a doctoral student, so I get very uh, heavily into the research part of this. Uh, awesome. So there are three different kinds of commitment uh, that individuals can have. Let's see if I can remember them. I think it was on a test. Uh, effective commitment, uh, continuous commitment, and normative commitment. Normative commitment is interesting. That means change is kind of baked into the cake, that your people are so adaptable and flexible, we don't have to do anything special. They're just going to adapt. They're going to roll with the changes. They're going to be good to go. So that's the ideal. Uh, it is very, very rare. Uh, what is more and more common, uh, what is more common actually, is continuous commitment. And what that means is, well, I'm committed to this plan of action only because the alternative is worse, right? Well, I'm going to do <laughs> or you will fire me. Uh, in organizational change management, there's something called burning platform, right? We got to get all this platform because it's going to blow up. So the alternative is worse. Uh, but what we're typically shooting for is what's called effective commitment. Uh, I am uh, I am honestly committed to this, internally committed to this. I use intrinsic motivators to be committed to this. It's typically longer lasting and a lot more effective than what is more typical, which is the normative commitment. 
That's fascinating. So question for you, since you have so much experience for us to tap on, do you have any real world examples that that we can just share that really don't violate any client privileges? Just some basic examples? Yeah, interesting. Well, I am going to talk about the client. We'll not mention a name, but uh, the client that I'm at currently is going through a large scale digital transformation, uh, multiple years. So they've been doing this for a little bit and they did an implementation of one part of SAP a couple of years ago. Uh, spent a whole lot of money on a training solution for it. Um, however, did not get the uh, the benefits uh, that they had invested in the ERP system. Uh, and we, we, we did take a look at their learning solution to try to figure out what may have been uh, gone wrong. So we give them some advice. Uh, but it was just a, uh, and, and it was ineffective for lots of different reasons. One, uh, there was a huge amount of information in it, just more information for an individual to absorb. Second, the information that was in it uh, there was some stuff that was important and relevant, uh, but there was some stuff that was really just trivia and not applicable. So the net result with this ineffective learning solution with this huge dump of information right before the go live was that their end users did not know how to use the new system. They're actually less productive after mm. the go live of their new system than they were with their old system. And even years later, two years later, they continue to struggle uh, with that SAP implementation. And it's because the learning approach in our estimation uh, was just too much. It wasn't focused in the right areas and it was too generic also. It had no... Uh, client-specific examples in it at all. So it was it was most theory and a lot of theory. So it was hard for an individual uh, learner to say, okay, this is what I need to do on my job. I mean, I know all of the theory and the whereases and the wherefores and the art of the possible, but what should I be doing? I have no idea. So really, because, uh, you know, and there are a lot of underlying reasons, uh, a lot of underlying reasons for this, of course. Uh, it, it takes time. It takes a lot of research. Uh, it takes a lot of commitment from the client and from the partner uh, to really get the right information organized in the right way to, to create an effective streamlined solution. They did not do that in that case. Uh, and, and the business is still suffering because they did an ineffective job. So when we were asked to come in, and we've been there about a year, and we've been planning out multiple uh, ERP implementations. So we, we look at the program level, even though we have a small team, uh, we're taking on typically probably twice to four times as much work as, as a team would of our size because we know that we can do this more effectively. And we're doing this by uh, a couple of different processes. Um, one is uh, we're using Scaled Agile. Uh, so we're an agile, uh, an agile organization. We go in two-week increments. Uh, we plan every two weeks. Uh, we have retros every two weeks. We demonstrate every two weeks. Uh, we have self-organized, self-managing teams. You have uh, me, I'm the scrum master for the team. So who is the servant leader? You know, basically I'm trying to make sure that the team has what they need in order to do a good job. It inverts the pyramid of normal leadership. So all of these kind of really important agile elements we're using. Uh, but in addition to that, our instructional design methodology is a bit different uh, in that we are doing content research now, making sure that we know uh, a lot more than is typical about both the solution that's going to be applied and the individuals that are going to be using that solution mm. uh, for any specific learning recommendations. We want to really, really, really know uh, what specific solution is being implemented, what, which of the, what of that functionality is going to drive the productivity of the business. Based on that, what are the knowledge and skills and behaviors that people have to have in order to drive the performance of the business? And that is what we are going to teach. Uh, so we have to learn what all of that is first before we can propose a specific learning solution. So that's a little bit different of an approach than how most organizations look at this. They usually come up with a solution first and then figure out how they're going to make it work. If you had to boil it down to the most common challenges among large organizations when it comes to realizing adoption ROI, what would they be, Scott? Well, it, it's not really uh, paying attention to the people part of the equation. Uh, I've heard okay. Multiple clients say uh, training is something happens at the very end of an ERP implementation. Uh, so uh, there is a shared belief that this is something we just kind of put together at the last minute uh, due to the end users, apply to the end users, and everything will be okay. Uh, but it doesn't really work out that way. Uh, okay. it, it's, a, uh, it's a longer investment of time. Uh, we get involved earlier in the project, so we develop the relationships that we need. And we start doing the research that we need to really understand the organization uh, and how the solution is going to be applied at the organization. 
ERP applications are, are hugely flexible. They're also highly customizable. And every uh, business does have to do a level of customization to it. Uh, because let's, you know, let's face it, you use the same uh, suite of applications in a manufacturing company, uh, defense contractor, uh, public service company, um, you know, to, uh, education uh, organizations, you know, uh, universities, you know, you've got this one program that can, that can be used in lots of different types of organizations. So they're going to be different every time uh, for the most part. How have you, from your experience, how do you address these challenges in a way that is kind of a win-win? It's, it's a win-win for the learners, but also it's effective for the organizations. Yeah, well, uh, what we found is that Agile is really helping us and uh, the instructional design methodology that we're using called guided experiential learning are both helping us think through uh, the relationships uh, that we have with the subject matter experts uh, and the other individuals in the business who have the information that is really important to drive learning and that we establish those relationships early uh, because we know we have to, we're have we going to have to work with them uh, across in, in <laughs> our current client months, right? Uh, we also have to make sure that, uh, that they know that we're all in this together, that our, that, our, uh, that our goal is the same, right? And that is we're not looking to just do the training solution while somebody else is just looking to do the OCM solution, while somebody else is uh, worried about the technology solution, and then the business has their own set of objectives that we really all have to work together and have to be very tightly aligned with what we're trying to achieve in order to achieve it. Because really doing an ERP implementation is extraordinarily difficult. And it, it requires a lot of time, attention, and effort. And it requires a sense of humor. It requires <laughs> pressure. It, it, you know, we're going to have to be friends even when you don't want to be friends uh, because, you know, we're going we're gonna to succeed or fail together. Okay, Scott. So, Share an example here of how we've put this into practice, how GP has gone ahead and, and helped blend this to help create some new behaviors. Yeah, well, very interesting. We had, uh, we had a client uh, in another department, but very important uh, partner of GP Strategies. And one of the parts of their organization was struggling uh, because they were implementing SAP uh, warehouse management uh, they had over 100 warehouses. They were rolling out SAP worldwide. Uh, they had done the first one, and it really wasn't going very well for them. Um, the, the, after we did some research, we, we saw the crux of the issue uh, was it's a warehouse, right? The most important part of the warehouse is that you bring stuff in, you put it on shelves, and then when customers order it, you can take it off the shelves, you can pack it up, and you can ship it, Right. Now, there's a group of people who do that that are warehouse workers. They are critical to the functioning of the organization. Uh, what had happened was a, a little more traditional approach was used to try to teach the warehouse workers. They brought them into a classroom and they showed them a bunch of PowerPoint slides. Sounds wonderful. Yeah, it was great. Uh, <laughs> so what, what happened at this warehouse, their productivity after their go live actually took a nosedive and never recovered. So once again, you had an example of we're going to implement an ERP system and make things worse. So probably not the direction you want to go. Right. We were asked to do a couple of things. But one of the things that we were asked was to look specifically at this learning solution uh, for the warehouse workers and see if we could come up with something different. Uh, so this was one of our first tries uh, for an Agile team. Um, so we were able to go in and do, do our analysis. We, and in Agile, we do a lot of experimentation. We don't say, ah, we know what the solution is. Now we're going to go in and build it. We say, we're gonna, we think we know what the solution is, so let's go in and experiment. If we succeed, great. If we fail, well, what can we learn from it and try something else? Uh, so we went through this experimental phase and uh, we came up with a better solution, uh, which we called Warehouse in a Box. And, and basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to help those warehouse workers build new mental models. So when they reach, uh, when they reach uh, something they have to do, they don't have to look something up or they don't have to think about it. They just already know in their heads, they're able to picture what they're going to do. Uh, I talked about baseball earlier, right? If you want to hit a home run, first place you have to hit a home run is in your head, right? You have to picture it. You have to see it. You have to be convinced of it. So we had to do the same thing with the warehouse workers. We had hmm. to help them build these mental models that they needed to be successful. So we went with the warehouse in the box scenario. Uh, so what we did is we, uh, we took photographs and we created big posters that showed them the various locations in the warehouse, the loading dock. Uh, the, the storage locations, and the shipping dock. 
And we had business processes, right? Very simple business processes to say, this is gonna happen in the real world. This is what you need to do with your scan gun. And oh, by the way, we're gonna practice it. So we took boxes, we scanned them, we moved them. So we, we were actually have them, having them do the physical movements and the physical location mm. in a classroom, right? So when they got back to work, they could go, oh, I know what I need to do here and I know how to do it. I can use a scan gun, I can move things around, I know where the triggers are, I know everything that I need to know based on this one kind of virtual uh, environment, not a not an electronic virtual environment. Right. Virtual In environment. analog virtual. I can see you're blending all those motor skills, you know, the <laughs> physical, the kinesthetic, the situational. But Scott, my question for you is, where are the PowerPoints? When can uh, I sit yeah. down and just watch passively for yeah, we, two hours, we, please? We actually didn't create any for that, so sorry. <laughs> okay, so, darn so sorry. it. Oh, um, man, my, I'm I mean, tearing up here. The only kind of deliverable we had is we created little flip cards that they could uh, either put in their pocket or put on the forklift. They would very quickly say, this is step one in the scan gun, step two, step three in the scan gun. But we imagined that those would be temporary uh, or for the newer workers, uh, that once people learn how to do the task, they, they would never have to refer to those. Sure. Things. One it's like a rocket be- booster, right? It's like get you up there and then it just it leaves yeah. after a while. Uh, but what was interesting from this was the results. So remember, before they never got back to their original productivity. Right. Well, first warehouse they applied this solution took them about four weeks to get back up to their original level of productivity. And then productivity could take off from there. The second time they did this, it went down to about two weeks. Uh, so what they mm. were able to do, applying a really effective learning solution not a theoretical classroom training solution. Right. Is we're actually able to A, uh, realize the return on investment that they were looking for out of SAP. And second, they were able to continue to roll forward those warehouse deployments, uh, which they had stopped because they had done such a horrible, horrible job uh, with the learning solution in the first case. Well, that's what happens when you hire GP. You get uh, your workforce transformed, Scott. So now you've uh, mentioned this. We've been waiting on it. We've buried the lead a little bit. This is about user adoption the agile way. And you have been covering this. You've been you've been unpacking the concept. But I want to ask that question. I'm not afraid of looking stupid. Ask my wife. Um, but here's what I want you to do is just let's compare the agile way to more of the traditional or normal way. So Professor Scott, just treat me like I'm a a fifth grader here and and do a compare and contrast for me, please. Yeah, it's interesting. The word normal is interesting because uh, (laughs) I've actually uh, written, uh, has spent a semester writing a research proposal uh, and looked into uh, what makes a, uh, the ideas that people had about what makes ERP implementations more or less effective. Uh, in literature, they're called critical success factors. Uh, okay. So I looked at dozens of studies with hundreds to thousands of subjects each uh, to try to come up with some universal view of, you know, what are the magic three things that I need to do on my uh, ERP project in order to be successful? Because everybody has an opinion on it. But after looking at all of this information, compiling it, doing the data analysis, I found that there was no consistent way uh, to... Hmm. Uh, to have an effective ERP implementation. So when you say normal, uh, and the the numbers kind of bear this out, right? Most ERP implementations, around 80% of them struggle in terms of of time, in terms of budget, in terms of planned functionality uh, to do that go lot. Uh, So I would say most normal ERP implementations are fairly dysfunctional. (laughs) <laughs> uh, because because they are. I mean, if we know that 80% of them struggle, right, uh, we know that dysfunction is kind of the norm. Um, an Agile team, though, we we kind of go at this from a different a different mindset. Uh, and, and oh, by the way, in, in traditional projects, you see what we refer to as waterfall. You see things like top-down management. Uh, okay, you got it. Governance. Uh, you see a lot of status reports or status reporting. Uh, which we're not uh, big fans of uh, in Agile. You know, to me, it's kind of like a status report is kind of like complaining about, you know, the fact that my baseball team lost yesterday, kind of too late to do anything about it. So why are we talking about it? You know, I need your help yesterday, not tomorrow. Oh, okay. Uh, so so some of the mindset, the little mindset stuff is different. Uh, but really in Agile, we, we emphasize more of an open and creative mindset. We value every individual that's on the team, right? From the newest person, to the most senior grizzled veteran, right? We're all valuable. 
We all have something to say. What I have to say may be stupid, but you're going to listen to it. What you have to say may be stupid, but we're going to listen to it because out of those stupid ideas, we may get something genius, right? Something just crazy enough to work uh, as a <laughs> movies. Uh, so we want that open and creative mindset. Uh, we want self-organized, self-managing teams, right? It's not my job as the uh, as the the quote unquote leader to tell you what to do, right? Leader leaders can be single points of failure, so we try to avoid that in agile. Mm. Uh, self self-organized, self-managed teams where leadership is emergent, not assigned. Uh, and then we have a position, the Scrum Master, which uh, emphasizes servant leadership. Servant leaders put their team first. They put the team's needs first. You know, me as a Scrum Master, it really doesn't matter what I need or what I want. It, it's all about the team. They're the people doing the work. They make the decisions about the work. And it is my job to help make them make that happen for them. And that's it. That reminds me of one of the quotes I've been really trying to internalize this year. And that is that action leads to insight. You're going to fail forward. You know, the more action, the more you're going to have insight, the more you're going to, you're going to move forward. It seems like that's maybe I'm inadvertently practicing agile. Scott, what do you think? Well, uh, it, it's interesting to me, uh, and the way that, and, and you can really tell, uh, if, if somebody is more waterfall or agile from their reaction to failure, mm. uh, uh, people typically in traditional waterfall react to failure in a very negative way. What has a tendency to happen, what has a tendency to happen, if people know that failure is going to be regarded negatively, they have a tendency not to report any failure, even if it means you got to fudge the numbers a little bit. So you have a tendency for the truth uh, to deviate from what is being reported after a while. Uh, major, major dysfunction. Uh, in Agile, we openly acknowledge failure. As a matter of fact, we're kind of looking for failure. And mm. failure, if you study it academically, is a very interesting thing. If you look at the people who uh, deal with life and death situations, uh, cardiothoracic surgeons, firefighters, you know, people who are really dealing with life and death. They don't study success. They study failure because mm. they, they know they learn more from failure than they ever will from success. So we, we're students of failure also. We tried something. It was stupid. We know it's stupid now. What do we learn from it? How can we do it better the next time? So we're flexible and adaptable. You know, talk about that all the time. <laughs> right? Be flexible and adaptable. Uh, you know, there was a movie, uh, Heartbreak Rage, right? Adapt and overcome. That's you. We we don't care what the problem is. We need to adapt and overcome and figure out what the solution is. We're not gonna we're not gonna complain about it. We're gonna figure out the solution. We're going to do the best we can. We're going to move on. We're going to learn from it and we'll do better the next time. Okay. So I, I'm on board with Agile. This is your choirs of angels are coming down right now. This sounds amazing. So, and I know you've been actively involved with this, as you've mentioned, implementing with clients for, for, you know, decades here, but can you give us a, just a couple more of examples of how you're applying this agile approach specifically with some of our customer organizations? Yeah. Um, well, I was, I was talking about a meeting we were on with a client earlier, and it was interesting because we were talking about our approach with the client, the, the levels of interactions that we had, and this was the leadership on the project and the, the feedback that we received, right? Particularly since there was a contrast between uh, the other company, the other company's approach and our approach. And they could clearly see the example of the other company's approach didn't work very well. Um, so uh, all of the things, uh, and, and by the way, we went in and interviewed quite a few of their end users uh, to find out what has worked for them in the past and what hasn't worked for them in the past. And it was interesting that hardly anybody ever talked to them about that. But to find out, you mm. know, what do people on the front lines think? We're very interested in that. You know, we, we try to develop a lot of empathy for the end user uh, because at, at the end of the day, they're the people who are going to have to do the work. So we need to take care of them. In order to take care of them, we need to know what their expectations are, uh, what works well for them to learn. And we want to design our learning solution around that. So developing a lot of empathy uh, for the end user is just mm. really important for us. Massive. And I heard you saying that earlier in terms of really getting in early and investing the time to, number one, understand the culture, number yeah. understand their operations, and then using that to craft whatever the user adoption approaches are. So empathy seems like a, a massive piece in here. So anything else that you want to share on that in terms of some agile approaches, Scott? Yeah, uh, we also find user stories to be very useful. Uh, user story in agile, and, and agile originally came out of the software development world. And okay. uh, do you know any software developers? Oh yeah, yeah, quite a few. 
So they're friendly, engaging folks, and they speak regular language, right? <laughs> oh, sure, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, they, they look at you kind of like a, in a bemused kind of, they cock their head a little bit. and yeah, They do like, things that I can't do, so I'm very grateful for them. Don't yeah, get me so wrong. Kind of like Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory, maybe not quite. <laughs> there you go, there you go, uh, right. This is my bad. Uh, we love you. We love you, software developers. We so we're just kidding. It's wonderful. But software developers <laughs> have a tendency to speak their own language, right? Yes. It agreed. Sharp or something like that, whatever it is. Same thing happens in SAP, by the way. Everybody starts talking okay. Japanese. Uh, but you have <laughs> your own language that you're using. And you you try to develop a requirement with somebody who works in the real world, a business user, right? And and they're speaking business user and you're speaking Japanese. And the two, there really is no way to translate between the two very effectively. Uh, so in the software development world, what they came up with was what's called a user story. And a user story is a very simple way in English to come up with a requirement, which basically is a user in this role has to do this action. So there's this result. So not in, in simple English, by the way. So that's how we're going to gather requirements. You know, a purchasing supervisor uh, receives a purchase requisition in their inbox and they need to approve it so that the purchase can be approved, the goods can be bought and it can be delivered to the business. You know, whatever the outcome is you're looking for there. So we have a tendency to express our requirements in the same way, right? We're not talking Japanese. We're not talking mm. IP. We're talking simple English. So this helps us to... Uh, develop empathy for the end user because we know what they're looking for uh, in the real world. And then we can talk about uh, from the technology side, they can talk about how they're going to achieve that technologically. But we want to talk about how do we achieve those knowledge and skills? So we we uh, try to quantify that task in acceptance criteria and performance criteria. Right. So how do I know it's a good purchase order? You know, what are the quality standards? What are, What is the troubleshooting I may need to have to go through? Uh, and, uh, you know, what happens upstream and downstream for this? So all of those really important questions for the end user, the user stories help us express that. So we can, first off, make sure that we've gotten the requirement correctly. Mm. We understand it because it's in English. The business user, users understand it because it's in English. And that's on the learning team, right? We figure out how to make that happen. But we understand the requirement also because it's in English. So it, uh, it, it helps with what's called clarity and alignment, which is really good you try to achieve strategically. And uh, we talk about that in, in McKinney Rogers, right? One of our GP divisions you can achieve clarity and alignment. Uh, that is a big, big thing. And those user stories help us to do that. Talking in English helps us to do that. Everybody being on the same page helps us to do that. Um, so there's just a lot of great uh, little techniques within agile, you know, that help with team health, that help with effective communications uh, that help with the relationships. I mean, it's weird because it sounds like all this touchy feely stuff. And what's interesting to me when he, when people hear agile, to me they hear it. You know, it kind of sounds touchy feely. Uh, and to a casual observer, it, it is touchy feely. Uh, but we're human beings. We're touchy feely people. You know, you were talking about a digital digital uh, adoption. Well, uh, all people are still analog, right? So uh, here in this, here <laughs> we're dealing with all these analog people, right? We have these certain techniques that we have to use in order to do that. Healthy relationships help with that. Agile helps with that. But at the same time, we have to remember that our objective, right, in Agile in Waterfall is exactly the same, right? We want to come up with the most effective, efficient solution possible. What we are saying on the Agile side, when we, when we work in this way, uh, when we have these great relationships, when we are touchy-feely, when we talk about requirements in this way, where we deal with things incrementally, where we healthily em embrace failure, we're going to do a far better job achieving those objectives than you waterfall people ever will. Oh, I can see that. I mean, just you talking about when you say it's touchy feely to me, that says you're giving professionals the license to do the best they can without that fear of, of judgment behind them. But also even just what you mentioned about having this user model is you're getting a chance to discuss that user story. And by creating that, I can see this mind map, of little subtle, almost tacit knowledge being unpacked that a programmer would never have a chance to get to if you just put down an outline and said, we need a purchase order, it needs to do this and this. When you start looking at it and having that story, all these bits of tacit, unspoken knowledge could come out and they could do a better job to serve the end user. So okay. that's, I, I think that's fantastic. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, and I agree. I mean, I'm a big believer in, uh, and, and I'm living it, so I, I know that it works very, very well. 
Uh, but underlying all of these things is one question. Uh, okay. Is important for adult learning uh, methodology. That question is important for relationships. That question is important for understanding. And then as why, you know, why are we doing this? Mm. Um, you know, down to the tactical level, right? Why am I doing this individual task? People want to know why, right? We need to understand the why, right? Down to the bigger level. Why are we even doing this SAP implementation? Well, we want to be a bigger, badder company, right? We're not just doing it to keep, you know, SAP stock <laughs> reported. No, we're doing this for a reason, right? We're going to spend a lot of money. We're going to spend a lot of resources implementing an ERP program. So we want to make sure we get our money's worth out of it, right? We want a better company. We want a happier people. What a more effective organization. That's why we're doing all this, right? We're not doing it for the fun of it. Okay. And Scott, I've got, I know we've got limited time with you. We know your schedule is, is packed here, but I had one thing in leading up and looking at this discussion. I had heard the word on the street that you are a lean learning experience team member or LLX. And that was a term that I have to admit as the podcast host and as a creative director that's usually in charge of creating pop and sizzle, I have no idea what that means. So first of all, can you unpack that and tell me what it means in terms of a benefit and any aspects related yeah, well, to it? Well, the lean learning experience is quite frankly is the, the packaging of all of these things that we're talking about for New York. Okay. PC, right. So how okay. do we create the most effective uh, end user training solution possible? So we've devoted a huge amount of research and finding out and experience, finding out what works and what does not work. What does not work is what's called discovery-based learning, dumping a whole bunch of information on the people and expecting them to learn it. What does <laughs> work is guided experiential learning. So okay. using examples, analogies, uh, real world examples so people can learn and create mental models. So that's a critical, important piece of it, uh, instructional design and development methodology. Uh, but in addition to that, our project management methodology uh, is agile, right? Uh, either uh, Scrum, which we've used on smaller teams, our scaled agile, which we're using in a really huge enterprise organization right now, has something like 80 agile teams. They're mostly IT agile teams. Uh, they're two or three learning agile teams, and we're one of those uh, that's uh, specifically in charge of the ERP portfolio. Okay, so what you're saying with a lean learning experience team, you're blending both the experiential concept of instructional design with an agile project project management process. Correct? Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is pretty common. I mean, if you look at okay. uh, the use of agile in software development, a lot of teams follow Scrum. Uh, but one of the things from Scrum is Scrum doesn't tell you how to do Scrum, which sounds kind of weird. Uh, but, <laughs> that uh, sounds like a t-shirt, by the way. Yeah. You know, uh, Scrum is just a very lightweight methodology. Uh, the actual technique of how you do the software piece of it. Yeah, so they'll use techniques such as Scrum and then things like paired programming, which isn't part of the Scrum framework, uh, but has like two people working on code at the same time. Uh, so kind of more of the day-to-day -day operational stuff is one piece of it. Uh, and that's, that's where we talk about gel and guided experiential learning, as opposed to how we run the, the team uh, which is more of the scrum slash safe piece of it. So it's those two elements together, uh, the project management and the instructional design and development methodology, those together make up the lean learning experience. So what you're saying is if you work with GP, one of the things we're going to bring to the table is this duality of the lean learning experience. Fair say? Yeah, I, I think so. Absolutely. Uh, and it's interesting to me because uh, we have a, a great mix of people on our current team who are both have a lot of experience. And some people are brand new to the industry, uh, but all of them are thriving in this environment. Uh, whereas usually, you know, it takes it takes a bit of time for one of our consultants to become very effective in more of a, a waterfall traditional approach. Uh, but we found the ramp up time and the amount of and the amount of effectiveness that we're getting, even in our new people, is just been amazing uh, because, you know, we're kind of removing a lot of that traditional hierarchical management methodology and, and allowing people to, you know, kind of freely express themselves, be who they can be, if you will, bring all of their ideas, silly or no, to work. Because again, sometimes the silly ideas end up being the great ones. Scott, you have unpacked so much about user adoption the agile way, both for me, but for our global audience. So I want to thank you so much for being on the podcast and being so gracious with your time. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Michael. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. I appreciate it anytime. 
The Performance Matters Podcast is brought to you by GP Strategies. Together, we can create a world where business excellence makes possibilities achievable. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get podcasts or listen on our website at gpstrategies.com.